next, Adam Willits from Brimhead. And we all talk about how spectacular our sites are and perhaps how difficult some of them are to access. <laughs> I think uh, yours is probably going to be the winner in all of those categories. Cheers, yeah, if Peter was a um, fluttering shearwater chick, I'm a, a stilt. Yeah. Um, and it comes from climbing that, climbing that hill, so yeah, we burn a few calories. Um, first of all, Chris, where's Chris gone? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Chris. Thank you very much for inviting us to speak today and, and for putting this all together for us. Big totoko kia koe. We're going to get you back, so. <laughs> Thank you. Got you. That, so so that goes forward. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, kia ora mai tato. Kua ora no te Whangarei uh, Ririna Paraua. Uh, G'day, I'm Adam Willits. I'm from Whangarei Ririna Paraua, the full Māori name for Whangarei, which means the gathering place of the whales. And um, it was quite amazing from a lot of the maps I've seen today, all these dots out on islands just offshore from us. And our vision is to get those dots onto the mainland and blow them up and make them way bigger. So um, welcome to my speech. Um, first acknowledgement there, you can see the lovely lady on the right going up one of those um, precipitous cliffs there to our great face site. She's at the back. She hates me um, talking about her, but that's Kathy Mitchell, um, the infamous Kathy Mitchell. And how lucky are we to have an expert like that? Sorry, I'll use that word again. She doesn't like me saying expert, but she is in my mind living right there at Ocean Beach with Pete and um, that we can tap into. So people have talked about that today to be able to tap in. So the Breamhead Conservation Trust has been going since about two, uh, 1998. Uh, 2020, we're not there yet. <laughs> and so, but we've been going intensive, our intensive program, Paul Rod Gates is one of our trustees here and um, an amazing man. Um, but we've been doing an intensive program since about 2011. Um, and uh, moving right along. So you can see where we sit. Oh, this has got a little light, isn't it, somewhere? Is that it there? Cool. Uh, so we're here, right on the end by, right next to the juxtaposition of a beautiful landscape next to the New Zealand's biggest industrial outfit, the refinery, which has a lot of lights at night, so it's probably a real problem too. Um, and so you can see our position, and my talk is mainly about getting the links. I mean, everybody's I'm going to the end of the last speech. You've heard everything. You know everything. You're all seabird experts. But what I, what I really want to focus on is all this amazing stuff that we've heard today out here on the Hen and Chicks and um, Taranga, the Hen, Mokahino, Kahino Group, um, Aotea, Te Hauturu or Toi, uh, all those beautiful islands going so well. I've worked on quite a lot of them. Um, no biz, and I know <laughs> ready from all the days. How are the cats doing anyway? On <laughs> don't talk about that. Okay. Um, I want to get them from there to there to there to there to there, and, and all through. And just like James with Tafanui, we're a non-fenced site. Okay, mainland site, 805 hectares. Um, oh shoot, too many. There, I'll, I'll go to that. There she is. There, there's the baby. Okay. Looks a little bit like a um, stingray for me. Mm -hmm. um, the area that we've got great coast which I'm going to mainly talk about today, is right out here. So it's 12 mm -hmm. mil cable climbing sort of terrain. Okay. And um, it's pretty exciting terrain there. Um, so this photo is taken from the air. Out towards our back are the islands. And I want to talk about, you know, how do we uh, not just talk about it, but in the future is is get that connectivity between the islands to the mainland so that all the children that I have 500 a year in the education site and the families from Whangarei and from elsewhere can come out for free, don't have to get on a boat and see all this stuff that you and I all see on the islands. Okay, so that's my dream. Um, and that's the trust dream. The trust vision is to restore the 805 hectare um, conservation, public conservation land reserve to as close to its former glory before human occupation. So that's our vision. And um, we're doing really, really well with passerines. We've got nine species of lizard. Um, we've translocated, thanks to the people at Tiri Tiri and the Puriora Forest, we've um, translocated in successfully two seasons now, whiteheads, Popo Katia and the Tōtōwai, the North Island robins, and they're going really, really well. And that's due to intensive predator control, um, which I'll talk about soon. So our thing that relates to this um, seminar is probably our, our success 
and, um, was the great face petrels. And our focus in our five-year plan wasn't on, um, in our original five-year plan, wasn't really on um, grey-faced petrels and seabirds, but it came about obviously because of our intensive control. So in July 2015, while putting in some tracks right out on that rocky um, outcrop that you saw at the end, um, I fortunately, while I was hanging out over a Pahutakawa tree, um, looking to put in a line on the cliffs, I stumbled across that top left site there and all the green guano, and it was the right time of year, fortunately. I think it was in about April, uh, May, June. And uh, I went, oi, what's going on here? <laughs> Doc, I'd heard about this. Doc had been looking for these sites for, for years and years and years, and um, was I lucky enough to find? So um, I went, told uh, uh, everybody about it, and they said, we'll go back and we'll go have a look. And I um, uh, found the one site with eight burrows, there was three adult um, GFP sitting on eggs and unfortunately that first year because we didn't have our rodent net control network in, that's what I was doing out at that point, I was trying to put in the last stage of the control network. Because we didn't have um, that control, we know that rodents predated the three eggs by the predation on the egg, the type of predation on the egg it was a dead giveaway for eggs. So we didn't get anything in that 2015, but we got our standard predator control added into the area. So coming to 2016, 10 eggs discovered this time, so quite a good jump. Um, they all hatched at um, egg stage, but um, so they obviously our rodent issue was fixed, but then all the 10 chicks later on, just before they fledged, were hit by the stoats as the stoats came through, or a stoat. 2017-18, uh, it was time to crank it up, and I was uh, sick of these stoats and sick of these rats. Um, so we went for a ground-based 1080 operation, and that's the tool um, that really did it for us. Um, intensive predator control monitoring around the sites, so Cathy put together a bit of a plan for us that we needed to track really intensively, um, tracking tunnels for rodents, um, uh, more Doc 200 traps, Steve Allen's um, traps as well, and we got 10 eggs to hatch. Um, we even then got, went one stage further and we got all the 10 chicks to come out and do their beautiful fledging and here's me at home, you know. Most people on a Saturday night are going out partying or going to the pubs over here. I'm watching grey-faced petrels and it's probably like a lot of you who've got, the, who've got what I call the, the disease. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's within the study site, burrow sites. And um, I think there's 20 burrows, we had 18 birds in there and we were really excited. But a lot of them could have been first timers back again, and it might just be due to that. But we know um, that, unfortunately, um, we caught a large, large male stoat on the camera, and there were no chicks. I went in through the study lids that we'd put on as part of our monitoring. We actually put study lids so we could go down to the burrows, pulled it, and, and had a look. No um, grey faced petrel chicks at all in the burrows, nothing at all. So that's stoat like behaviour when they take it away and den it in their food den, which we've had in, in, in the first year. So that was pretty gut-wrenching again, just like Dana said from Tutakaka, you, you put your heart and soul, you sweat up a steep hill and you, you think, dream about it all night <laughs> instead of going partying. And um, yeah, it's gut-wrenching again, but what it has um, convinced me is that we're going to go 1080 every two years, um, not every three. Um, it is another tool in the toolbox, got to be very careful with 1080 if you know the toxicology of 1080 and how it works for anyone out there doing the same sort of thing. You have to be very careful because it's an acute toxin that you deliver it exactly at the right time and you space it out. And that's why I don't believe pulsing on its own is very the, a good answer. You need to use the whole suite of tools um, because toxin shyness and all that sort of stuff. Um, so what we also had though, we've also been monitoring. The, first, the reason why back in July 2015 that we thought that we might have grey-faced petrels, we picked them up, the Pete and Cathy um, had picked them up in 2013 in their last year, doing, uh, setting up the operation. And, um, and now, right down here at the end, we've also picked up Cook's petrel and Flutter and Shearwaters, which we know, through Chris and everybody, should be just right out offshore. Um, I've had a Flutter and Shearwater dead on the ground near the Peach Cove hut um, that had been predated. Um, down there, so we know they're around. So hopefully we can um, get into that. But it's early days for us. Um, 
How did we get there? Um, so just um, a little bit about what we do in terms of our control for anyone who might be quickly interested. Um, so we staged it in four stages to do intensive control. So we have um, over the entire reserve now, 805 hectares of intensive forced stage process from 2011. We now have 1,250 bait stations. If I go forward one, that's all our bait stations there. <laughs> so um, that has to be serviced monthly. Um, so this is what happens when you work on the mainland without a fence. So originally, there was talk about putting a fence along the seven and a half kilometres, but we wanted to prove that you could do it on the mainland because if you're going to go predator free 2050, you're not going to be able to put fences up everywhere. So we're trialling. Where our peninsula, as you can see, water on three sides. Okay, we've got the connectivity of the islands. If, um, I can't remember who had the, I think it was Dave Towns had it up about the birds and their sort of feed, their living zones and they couldn't get back to the mainland. But if you, I just looked at this map and the Great Mercury's of the Coromandel Peninsula was all sorted out with intensive control, then they could hop from there and over into the Auckland area where he said they couldn't gap into. So um, these community groups working with professionals and the, and the science that you all amazing researchers, I feel like a dwarf amongst giants, <laughs> all the researchers. Um, but if we could all work together in a holistic network, as we're all talking about under Umbrella, working with like um, the Seabird Trust, um, we really could be the next stages of the peninsulas to get the birds and everything to hop, come back and connect through back to the mainland like it used to be. Um, going back, so you can just see how quickly, you all know it, um, how quickly the possums have gone down. So we've got to, um, we catch one possum every two months on an open sanctuary mainland site. And same with stoats and our rats and indices are about 1% per annum. So I put a trap out anywhere in the reserve at any one time, I've only got a 1% chance of catching a rat. Although the real big issue um, going on forward now is Norway's, as all the groups are starting to find out. All of a sudden we're all worried about Norway rats now because we've got rid of the shippies. Um, they're suddenly, uh, they're not so good on the toxin. We've got problems with them. Um, yeah, so 2018 rodent uh, tracking index, 1% annual average. Um, thank you, John, that's your lovely hand there on the left. You must notice that hand quite a bit, yeah. So there's um, other stuff that we're doing, other species. So um, rangers and volunteers and students all working together. We do Kathy Mitchell helping out with the grey-faced petrels, as I said. We do five minute bird counts, we do kiwi listening acoustics, um, we do lizard surveys, we do tracking tunnels for um, our results, not only on the predators, but weta as an invertebrate uh, indicator species. Because um, everything is ecosystem linked, as we all heard about today. We don't have all the, all the parts of the ecosystem. So we're a full ecological restoration project on the mainland, without a fence, community driven, with a really good plan. and. Um, we want to go to the next level. We want to get that 1% down to zero. We want to get the, you know, the grey-faced petrels surviving every time. We want to get those cooks back and all that. Um, so we also do placard stylus style snail surveys and seabird and forest bird acoustics. We've done two translocations of birds. We have nine lizards uh, species. One of them is endemic only to Breamhead in the, in the whole entire world. The Breamhead skink, the Ben Barr. And um, Kathy and Pete helping with that. Um, I see Cathy laughing because there's a little bit of debate who found it. <laughs> no, there's not. Pete found it. We'll leave it there. And the other thing, the great thing to do is just a big um, toe talk or a big shout out to our volunteers. Please keep, keep the volunteers coming. Citizen Science, I think um, Brendan was talking about Citizen Science. Um, and under a big network, I think that's the way forward as well. Because you not only get them to help you with it, but you get their buy-in when it comes to politics. Time to vote and all that, so that's hugely critical. Um, the great thing about our volunteers too is we've got them to be doing all our north side sort of maintain uh, routine maintenance, which has freed the, myself up to do an intensive boundary now. So we do a boundary every week where we used to only check the boundary month, uh, monthly and we've got 25 devices on it now. So that's a, a big step up. Um, and then just going forward to finish up with, because I see both gentlemen have stood up, so I'm really in trouble. <laughs> like, the, like the bouncers at the pub here or something. Karen <laughs> um, stands up, it's got to be moved. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I talked about, uh, so data analysis is really cool. Things I'd love to see is um, AI software, and um, Dana's mum's a real expert up there with us at Tutukaka on software. Um, and more students, more volunteer support. Um, talked about Norway Rats, funds for a holistic seabird project, so working with maybe with the trust. Um, we've got a memorandum of understanding with AUT, so we're trying to get um, PhD students to help us out. And then working is together, linking the conservation groups up and then getting the work done ahead. So like ahead of Bream Head, um, we could be working further afield so when it comes time and the birds do come to Bream Head, like we've seen with the bellbirds and the kaka that have naturally come back from the islands, they're now able to spread up the coast. So working ahead with those groups. And then Predator Free 2050, we just got six million um, for our area. There's going to be eradication of possums first. I am allowed to say this now. Um, it's all go. And the council's putting in about four million. And so um, that huge buffer and that eradication of those species and big, and that's going to be stoat and rat suppression from Breamhead to Tutukaka to the um, Whangarei city is rat and stoat suppression and eradication of possums in the first five years at Whangarei Heads. That's going to have a massive effect on those darn stoats that keep coming along and giving me the giving me nightmares. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. Um, the pub bouncer analogy was a very good one. It, uh, it's a bit of a feeling that the tables are being, the chairs are being put on the table, and uh, and we do have to move out. So.